Good evening from Los Angeles. I'm Anjali Sharon, Acting Executive Director of Asia Society Southern California. Welcome to today's program on cryptocurrency and esports. This is our third program on esports, and we're pleased to welcome back our veteran moderator, Miles Yim, to lead this evening's discussion. Miles is a communication strategist at the Story Mob and was formerly an esports journalist for ESPN and the Washington Post. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Miles. Thanks, Angeli. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, she was right. I am Miles Yim. I am a communication strategist at the Story Mob. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We've got a great panel for you discussing something I think that's on everybody's mind, cryptocurrency, blockchain, NFTs, all of those fun, interesting Web3 buzzwords and technologies. We've sort of seen them pop up in the traditional sports world, haven't we? FTX with the Miami Heat and the Golden State Warriors and umpire jerseys and Major League Baseball. I've also seen my beloved Los Angeles Lakers rename their stadium to crypto.com. Cryptocurrency, blockchain seems to be everywhere. Uh, but for the purposes of this conversation, we are going to discuss how it particularly intersects with esports. Seems to be a lot of natural alignment there, but is there? And what's next for this uh, marrying of two industries? Uh, joining me, I have two fantastic panelists to help talk it out. I'll have them introduce themselves individually and also briefly go over the organizations that they represent. Uh, Chris, let's start with you. Thanks, Miles. Hey, everyone. My name is Chris Gonzalez. I'm the CEO of Community Gaming. We are an esports tournament platform. We make it simple for people to create tournaments and to earn cryptocurrency. So we set up wallets for them and it would make it very simple to earn your first cryptocurrency playing in all types of competitions. Awesome, Michael, though next, I'm Walter. I'm COO of TSM FTX. We're an esports team. Um, our HQ here is in LA, but we have teams all over the world. I, we have over 17 teams now. And uh, as you all can tell from our name, FTX, we are sponsored by FTX, a cryptocurrency exchange. Walter, it's funny in the introduction, uh, Angela referred to me as a veteran moderator. You, sir, are absolutely a veteran panelist, having been <laughs> on all three of these esports opportunities. Uh, so great to have you both here to help me talk about this. And Walter, I want to stick with you, actually, because as you just said, it's kind of in the name, uh, TSM, man, I remember when that stood for Team Solo Mid, and now it's TSM FTX. And if there is any place to start in the conversation. It feels like this is the best place to start. Uh, the New York Times reported that this sponsorship between FTX and TSM that included the naming rights was for 10 years, $210 million, an amazing trend setting amount. Can you sort of go into how this happened and what it means for TSM, FTX, and what the future holds for both of you as uh, collaborators? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, FTX deal is huge. It's huge for us and huge for the esports industry. Um, the largest esports deal, I think, in history of esports, um, which is really funny how, how it started, actually. It started off with a DM, a Twitter DM. Um, basically, Andy, our CEO, um, because he wanted to learn more about crypto, learn more, learn more about FTX, he DM'd uh, Sam, SBF. He's a very a legend in the crypto space. He started Alameda Research. He also started uh, FTX, the FTX Exchange, and just DM'd him on Twitter. And that conversation turned into finding out that Sam is a big League of Legends fan, right? Obviously, a team that we have a lot of a storied past in, a game we have a storied past in. And then that turned into him wanting to sponsor our team. Right. And in within, I think, two months, we went from negotiation to pitch to finalization of the assets to launch of marketing campaign. I think in two and a half months, it was two of that two and a half of the craziest months I've ever been working in my life. A uh, lot of lot of late nights for sure um, doing all of that. Um, maybe to get into a little bit of why they did it. Right. Um, the FTX, you know. It's, it's a big exchange. I think everyone in who's really crypto native really knows about crypto of FTX because they have such great standing, they have a great reputation, they have the best technology, they have no fees when you trade on the platform, but they don't have as much of that, you know, retail exposure, right? Like a Coinbase, right? To the to the masses. They don't have that name. And so they really wanted to, you know, really take away market share, right? Away from Coinbase and from these other exchanges that are you know more well known. And so they really wanted to invest in a lot in their marketing. And that's why you see them having sponsored TSM, you see them sponsoring, you know, the Miami Heater 
arena, the, the MLB, Tom Brady, Steph Curry, the Warriors, F1. I think they probably spent the most in marketing this in 2022 than any other company in the world. Um, and one thing that is special about them sponsoring TSM was because of two things. Number one is that our gaming and esports has so much crossover, right? We have digitally native audiences. The age demographic is correct. Um, we're all used to digital currency, playing video games. So, you know, that made, 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 made a lot of sense. And the second is that the TSM FTX deal is the first of its kind in sports and in esports, where not only do they have the naming rights of our team, so we're called TSM FTX, but literally every single one of our players and, our, and their social names and display names on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok, all change to TSM FTX. So now it's TSM FTX Wardell, TSM FTX Bolo. And the amount of exposure you get from that kind of naming rights compared to an arena like SoFi Stadium or you know FTX Arena in the, for the Miami Heat, it's just the impression numbers are just insane comparatively. So that's a little bit about the FTX deal. And it's, it's a tremendous infusion of resources, Walter. Where do you think, you, how, how is TSM going to build off of uh, this partnership? What, what, is, what, is, what do the two of you have in store together with each other that you could potentially tease right now? Yeah, I think number one is a, a lot about uh, financial education, right? And education, right? I think a lot of people need to be educated on decentralized finance, right? Blockchain technology. And it's only in the interest of FTSM and, and, and of FTX to collaborate on a lot of initiatives to educate, you know, whether through our players and our talent, through streaming activations, through content about, um, about blockchain technology, about decentralized finance and things like that. We also have a lot of cool, uh, we have like an investment challenge that we are sort of cooking up um, where people, well, I can't talk too, too much about it because it hasn't been finalized, but you know, um, you know, where, where users can, can participate in this challenge and get crypto and, and sort of invest and, and get a taste of how, how it would work. Um, and I think, you know, another big thing for, for just for, for TSM, right, is like, look, FTX, they're, they're, they're a company of gamers. They, like everyone at FTX loves playing games. They grew up playing games. They love, they love watching esports. And so it just enables us to also, you know, just go after the best talent and continue to expand, you know, the teams and, and try to win some championships. Chris, I know Community Gaming has partnered with other uh, blockchain adjacent or blockchain exchanges themselves. Uh, tell me about how Community Gaming sort of approaches their integration into the blockchain space. I know it's it's a very direct way where TSM and FTX sort of have partnered together. Community Gaming is, is actively leveraging blockchain technology to execute on uh, it's 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 core uh, deliverables. Can you can you tell me about what community gaming does and and how it's integrating the blockchain to serve those ends? Yeah, sure. So uh, when we got started out, uh, we were running in person events. I'm based in New York City, and so pre pandemic, before our events were shut down, uh, we were running grassroots events every single weekend. You know, 50 to 100 people, and we saw a lot of pain points around setting up the tournament, managing it, and then the big one was around payments. And so whether you're talking about online events or in-person events, you know, paying out dozens of people um, can be quite tedious and quite difficult, right? I would be the one frequently sending there, uh, setting out dozens of PayPal payments, you know, taking an hour to send out um, a whole tournament's worth of payments. And each payment on PayPal, for instance, would have a 50 cents minimum fee. I'd be copy and pasting addresses and there'd be typos and I couldn't reach people. And so when the pandemic hit and our events in person got shut down, uh, we built out community gaming .io, and we built it out with uh, the idea that we want to abstract away the complexities normally associated with blockchain tech, but still bring the benefits to, to our players and to the end users. And so when you sign up on communitygaming.io, you have a wallet that is generated for you if you don't have your own. Like if you have a MetaMask, you can connect it, but uh, over 70% of our users do not have a self-managed wallet, right? Maybe they've, they've had a uh, an FTX account or a Coinbase account, but they've never had their own that they can link to websites. And so we facilitate the creation of a non-custodial wallet where they still stay in control. And then they can join tournaments. These can be tournaments for League of Legends, um, and it can be tournaments for new Web3 games like Axie Infinity. And through the easy setup process, someone who is a first-time tournament organizer can create a tournament in less than five minutes, and that includes pre-configuring how they want all the payments to go out at the end. So as an example, you can set up a tournament where you want the top 32 people to get paid out. You set those amounts. And at the end of the tournament, all 32 of those payments go out for about a five cents fee. 
And so we're, we're built using smart contracts that hold that crypto in escrow while the tournament plays out and then sends out those payments to those connected wallets. And so um, that is a very efficient and, and cheap way to send out mass payments. And it doesn't require any blockchain knowledge from the users. Interesting. Uh, what kind of exposure does community gaming have to the, to the wider esports scene? Because to me, it sounds like there's a very grassroots appeal uh, to folks using the platform. Um, what other examples of community gaming sort of direct uh, interfacing with the wider esports scene uh, has there been uh, uh, so far? Yeah, so uh, we have our flagship events that, uh, that we've run with games like Valorant and League of Legends, and these are broadcasted on Twitch. So these can be you know, um, streamed to hundreds of thousands of, of unique eyeballs. And so uh, we're leveraging our technology to educate people how uh, DeFi and setting up wallets works in the middle of a huge Twitch stream, right? So we'll run commercials. And so we'll be able to teach people, you know, how can I uh, use this crypto that I've earned? It can be something like a stable coin, right? It's something that is really useful for people maybe in emerging markets that face uh, a lot of inflation. And so in the middle of playing or watching a traditional esports tournament, uh, we'll try to educate them on how they can use a stable coin, how they can earn it on our platform, and then how they can take that crypto and then maybe use it to buy groceries or to, uh, to buy something um, in their local currency. And so we try to blend that mixture of a typical broadcast um, that we run with educational purposes. And so uh, that can be as big as you know a $100,000 tournament and then grassroots organizers uh, from places like Latin America and Southeast Asia can use our platform without us just as a self-serve tool to run micro tournaments for their communities. Interesting. So community gaming is directly integrating block technology into what it does. TSM FTX is obviously partnering with a major cryptocurrency exchange uh, to both sort of grow together. And I think in both instances, there's sort of this tacit recognition that there is a crossover between audiences who enjoy or, or participate in or consume esports and audiences who participate or consume in cryptocurrency or just the wider blockchain technology. Well, you touched on this a little bit before earlier, and I'm wondering if you could expand this answer. Like, yes, these audiences are, are obviously digital natives. There's that, that surface level symmetry. But digging really into the details here, what do you see as the, the major crossover proof points that sort of uh, merge these audiences together and in, 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 into one. Why are esports fans and gaming fans interested in cryptocurrency and vice versa? That's a good question. I think, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of crossovers, there's a lot of, a lot of touch points here. So I think number one is that, um, look, I think the cryptocurrency, crypto, crypto world, right, skews a little bit younger, right, from a demographic perspective. And those are the those are the same. That's the same thing for esports, right? Our average fan base is between, I believe, 17 to 28, right? And you know, while while major league sports like MLB and, and, and I think MLB's average age of fan is like over 60 years old now. And so, from an age demographic, you know, there there's a lot of crossover. I think that another thing is is that esports and, and video game players they're, they're they're very digitally native right they're very technology savvy right they know how to build their own pc they under can understand hash rates they under can more more likely understand the blockchain technology they're more open to it they they um they're just a little bit more technology savvy and so that that's why there's a lot more crossover between you know the esports audience and and then the blockchain audience and i think number three is i think chris also talked about it right is the web3 games the nft games right the play to earn games Right. I think um, the, if you take a look at the history of video games, right, there's been like three really big like developments. Right. Number one was like you, you pay to play. Right. You buy a, DC, like a CD or you buy a game on Steam right, and you play the game. And then Riot and League of Legends really, you know, shake, shook, shook the whole world by, by introducing free to play. Right. You can play a game and now it's free. Now through blockchain, through Web3, now it's all about play to earn, right? Games like Axie Infinity or like Zed Run or like, you know, Ember Sword and all these new games coming out, right? You can actually play games and earn crypto, right? And at one point for Axie Infinity, I think the worldwide average monthly income just playing the game was I think $1,500 a month, 
right? And so, so someone in the Philippines or someone in Vietnam, I mean, why work at a factory or work work at any job really? If you can be, if you play this game eight hours a day and make fifteen hundred US dollars a, a month, I mean, that's that's a, that's an amazing salary, right? And so that's what's what's really interesting. Chris, building off of that, I know play to earn is a subject very near and dear to your heart. Uh, what else do you have to add to the discussion? Not just about sort of the crossover between the audiences and, and where that sort of organically comes from, uh, but this idea of play to earn and, and what it means for uh, gaming going forward. Yeah, so, um, you know, for all of the history of, of games up until this point, it, it's really been this idea of I'm paying money to the game developer and I might have skins in that game or weapons and those items are traditionally locked to that account, right? You, you cannot sell them back to anyone, the game developer or your friends. Typically, you can't even trade items uh, in, in most, let's say, mobile games. And so um, it's a one-way street of value exchange. And so you cannot monetize your time, right? Your, my mom would always say, you know, you're wasting time playing video games. You're not getting any, any real value from that. And so this, this, these core principles around play to earn uh, are really kind of creating an open game economy where now, of course, you're still spending money to get into the game and to, and to acquire assets, either through your time or through money. And then you also have the ability to liquidate or trade or sell uh, and, and be able to earn supplemental income, or as Walter was saying, in, in some cases, um, uh, income that can exceed your, your real life job, which, which perhaps you know, is, a, is a manual labor job or a job you just don't enjoy. Um, and so you can, you can have both, right? You can have someone in the Philippines playing Axie Infinity and he's, uh, he's driving a taxi for four hours a day. And then he spends another four hours uh, grinding and playing competitively in a game like Axie or the dozens of other play to earn games that are, that are coming to market. And so the two core principles I like to say with play to earn is enhanced ownership. So those are the digital items. Those are the skins. Those are the land, digital land. Those are the weapons. You can really own them. You can trade them freely. You can view them outside the game and you can build um, different tools on top of these economies. And then second is the ability to monetize your time, as I was saying. Um, it's no longer a waste of time with gaming. That stigma uh, can, can really kind of go away after these, these games proliferate, um, and you can earn really meaningful income in these play to earn games. Staying with you, Chris, for a moment, I think uh, we're sort of blowing through concepts really quickly. This idea of blockchain gaming, it, it's it's certainly in the zeitgeist right now, people have heard about it. Maybe they've even heard of play to earn, but I think for a lot of folks, it's difficult to conceptualize what it means to play a blockchain game. Like what exactly is involved in the, in the mechanics of it? So I'm wondering, and, and Walter, feel free to add on to this, uh, but we'll start with Chris first. Can, can you give me like an overview of, of what it actually means to play a game like Axie Infinity or a game like Skyweaver? Sure. Um, so Skyweaver is a great example uh, because probably many people have heard of Hearthstone or Magic the Gathering. It's, it's a trading card game. And so to have a trading card game, you have to build up a deck of cards and then you will play against usually uh, either the computer or against other players, usually called uh, PvP mode. And so in, uh, in Magic the Gathering, you go and you buy packs in the real world, right? And you have a, you have a real collection. You can, you can sell those cards on a secondary market. And so Skyweaver is, is just kind of like a digital version of Magic the Gathering or in a version of Hearthstone where you really can just buy and sell those cards on a marketplace. So in order to get started in these, these play to earn games, uh, there is usually um, a, a starting cost, right? You have to buy assets that you can then, uh, that then become productive assets, right? You can earn a yield on them, you can stake them, you can use them to grind away daily missions and earn small amounts of money each day. And, and so um, you first have to buy into the system. And I think Walter knows a lot about the guild world and how that ties into this whole system of being able to lend out assets. Yeah, to talk a little bit about like the guilds, I don't know if maybe maybe people on in the, who are watching this panel are know about YGG or Avocado Guild and things like that. But basically, a lot of these NFTs that you have to buy, right, like whether it be an Axie and Axie Infinity are, are quite expensive, right? Sometimes at one point, you know, the average Axie was like, what, $300, right, US dollars. And so to a lot of people who it's a, it's a, it's a big barrier to entry. And so what these guilds do, right, is that it's kind of like a microfinancing business is where people will buy um, these NFTs like Axies and they will loan it out to people who cannot afford a whole Axie and they will just take a revenue share of whatever those of these people sort of make and they call them scholars, right? These scholars get lent these NFTs and and they get a, they get a revenue stream, whoever's lending them out. And so it's a very interesting microfinance business, right? In, um, in this world. And so, you know, 
guilds are, are becoming very, very big. And I think, uh, you know, TSM is obviously looking into guild as well because we have a huge fan base, right? And so it's like, how do we, could, could we create a guild, right? Could we, you know, if blockchain, if blockchain games in the future are going to be very big, should we create a guild? You know, there are some people, you know, prominent figures in the video game world saying, you know, in the next 10, 10 years, all games will be play to earn, all games will be, you know, blockchain games, but who knows? But that's something that um, is, is definitely on the rise and something that everyone is looking at. Yeah, I think so. And staying with you, Walter, how, I mean, with gaming comes esports, right? Like, it, it, what is esports if not competitive gaming? And to my limited understanding of blockchain gaming, there certainly is like a competitive aspect to certain elements, Skyweaver and, and Axie Infinity, I'm thinking of specifically. Is there is there a TSM sort of Axie team on the horizon for you, for you Walter? Are, are you getting into Skyweaver? What's, what's, what do you feel like, um, and you touched on it a little bit, but what do you feel like TSM's future is in blockchain gaming esports, or if esports itself is even a viable application to something uh, like blockchain gaming? Oh man, this is this is there's so many thoughts here. There's so many for thoughts it. here. Yeah, but um, I think I think you know there's definitely a competitive aspect, right, to these blockchain games. Like if you played Axie Infinity, right, the more you win, the more you earn, right. And so, I I don't think TSM is looking at an Axie team right now, but we do evaluate. We we are basically evaluating all new play to earn games, right? If they have a viewership. Right, and they're they're fun games, and they have people want to watch it. Yeah, absolutely, we're going to pick up a team, even whether it's a blockchain game or not. And I think that it's just an added incentive for people to play these games, right, and compete because they can actually earn a living, maybe, or a side income from it until they make until they go pro. So I think that 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 is very very interesting. And I think you know to touch a little bit on Chris's point about like these these items, right, and the and and the interoperability and owning these digital items, right. It's happened in video games and esports for a very long time already, right? People used to farm World of Warcraft gold, right, for real money, but it's kind of illegal. People would, you know, do that on the Diablo 3 auction marketplace before, for real money. People, you know, farmed accounts for League of Legends. So, you know, this is this is something that I think the video game community is pretty used to already, but then now blockchain is really just making it more accessible, more transparent, and more secure. So that's kind of really interesting as we move forward um, into a into a Web 3.0 world. Chris, as somebody who has his ear to the ground on all things blockchain gaming, I'm curious to hear sort of first your take on what needs to be improved on blockchain gaming as a whole to sort of grow its its audience. And then if there are any games on the horizon outside the two that we've touched on, Skyweaver and Axie, uh, that really excite you as, as, as the, the sort of next step for blockchain gaming? Yeah, sure. Um, so there, you know, we're really in our infancy uh, with, with Web3 games. I think you've seen a lot of the innovation uh, bubble up from the bottom, right? Indie developers, right? That, that don't have the resources that, you know, Activision, Blizzard, uh, or Take-Two has. And so some of the games that have been the first to take off um, have not necessarily been AAA quality uh, with, you know, $100 million development budget, like, you know, the World of Warcraft of the world. So I think as, uh, as the, the months go on, you're going to see games that have been in development now for two years, it takes, you know, two, three years to create a great game. They're going to start to come to market, right? They're going to come to market this year and over the next 12 to 18 months, and they're going to blend the play to earn disruptive, innovative elements with uh, a game that's extremely, extremely fun, right? That you would play with or without the earning components. And so, uh, you know, maybe I would say a lot of the early play to earn games have had kind of the financial incentive, uh, get ahead of the, the, the level of fun, right? And so um, if you're playing a game purely for financial incentive and the game's not also fun, um, you know, you start to have uh, situations where, you know, you, you, you feel more like a job, right? And so if you can blend that perfect mix of the game is really fun and I would play this anyway, and I have the ability to earn a, a little bit of extra income. And, and if I want to stop playing the game six months from now, I can, uh, I can sell my items and, and take that value back some of it, or even in, at a profit level. Um, I'd say that's, that's what needs to be improved. And then secondarily, these in-game economies are extremely complex, right? And, and I think uh, a lot of them were designed uh, not by um, uh, professional economists, but by developers and, and enthusiasts, uh, you know, passionate gamers. Uh, and so I think you're going to start to see a lot more uh, real game economists be hired 
by these these studios, right? I think I think you really need to be able to design the correct balance of money coming into the system, money going out, correct um, incentive loops to have that balance, right? If you want to have a sustainable game with 100 million players, that that is a player in game, um, it really needs to be professionally designed from a, an economy level. So I think you're going to see that become a really important role at all of these player in games is is these economists. Um, what was the, the other question was their upcoming games? Yeah, any titles you've got your eye on? The one, one that I have my eye on is called Fate and Arena. And so this is, um, you know, this can be thought of as a game that's similar to Brawl Stars, you know, one of the most popular you know, mobile games um, as, part, as part of uh, Tencent, I believe, Supercell. And so this is a really, really fun game. You know, I, I've been playing this game, you know, not really paying attention to, to how much I'm earning, uh, but I've been playing it for a few weeks and, you know, I earned a few hundred dollars. And so um, I would play this game with or without that element to it, right? It's a really fun game like you would, you would think for a game like Brawl Stars. And so that's one I have my eye on where you can tell that there's, you know, a lot of polish. The game's been in development for a while. And, and so that, that added uh, incentive is really what pushes it over the top for me to, to be more invested than I would if it was a game that I knew I, you know, would abandon in six months and not have any ability to uh, sell my assets. Speaking of game development, I'm going to hot take both of you. Uh, we did not discuss this in, in the outline, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, the topic of the day that everybody in the gaming universe is speaking about is this massive acquisition by Microsoft, $68.7 billion, the biggest acquisition of its kind in the history of gaming. Uh, they acquired Activision Blizzard, uh, makers of World of Warcraft, Call of Duty, et cetera. This is a massive investment for what some would consider a, a quote unquote distressed asset with all of the uh, negativity uh, and controversy surrounding Activision Blizzard at this time. And I'm curious to hear from both of you, since this is about this is a panel about crypto and esports uh, and the future and Web3 and blockchain technologies, to what extent do you think this was a play by either side, the uh, Activision Blizzard or Microsoft itself, in this, in this arms race to prepare for quote unquote uh, the metaverse or the Web3 future that we all seem to be racing towards? Do you feel like there was any sort of, we're looking at Web3 future, uh, calculus made in that investment? Or, or was this just Microsoft really loved, loves WoW? They love their warlocks and then their druids and, and they had to have it under the, the banner and man Overwatch League, that's amazing. Uh, Chris, I want to start with you, then we'll go to Walter. Yeah, so I think I saw the main uh, Satya Nadella quote um, was, you know, this will help power uh, future metaverse platforms, right? So he specifically uh, called that out and kind of referred to uh, all of these incredible franchises as you know part of a, a future uh, strategy that they have on on the metaverse. And so you know I don't think they're going to explicitly you know state you know we're going to create World of Warcraft NFTs or, or something like that. But uh, I do think that that is kind of in the back of their mind. You know Microsoft has been one of the first uh, and and one of the earliest proponents of especially Ethereum uh, technology, right? They, they joined the uh, Ethereum Enterprise Alliance early and, and they have a lot of people there that's dedicated to, to building out and exploring uh, different use cases. So I do think, um, you know, there, there's kind of a, a longer term plan. It's probably not gonna be in the immediate uh, near future um, to, to think about some of these huge, you know, childhood franchises that we all love and how, you know, the sequels of them could potentially incorporate uh, digital assets that are blockchain enabled. Yeah, and to touch on that, I, I definitely do think, you know, every video game company or every, any big tech company as well is all thinking about metaverse, right? Um, you, you've seen, you've heard, sort of seen that uh, different, different publishers and different game developers as well, right? Like Ubisoft came out with their first NFT item, uh, didn't go too well, but at least they tried, right? And I think, um, I think, um, you know, Riot, Riot Games, I know, is also looking at it, you know, and all these new game developers are all looking at it. I think that, um, yeah, I think, I think, I think definitely Microsoft is thinking about Metaverse with this Activision uh, acquisition. Well, you said the three magic letters, and now we have to address them. NFT, uh, non-fungible token. This is part a major part of the conversation around the intersection between esports, gaming, and the crypto universe. And I want to start because not everybody might be up to date on the concept of an NFT. Uh, first of all, Chris, can you give us a breakdown uh, of what an NFT is and how it has anything to do with gaming? 
Sure. So, it, you know, in fact, it doesn't just have to do with gaming. It You can think of an NFT as a type of crypto token that's used to represent a digital asset or a physical asset. And usually you're representing a digital asset that's unique. So you can think of it kind of like a digital uh, certificate that can go along with a video game item, or it can go along with a piece of artwork or, you know, uh, a, a rare Nike shoe. Um, and so, you know, these unique identifiers um, are come along with a digital signature on a blockchain, right? So it comes with all types of metadata that you can associate with ownership of an item. And so, um, you know, some of the features when you, when you apply this to video game economies, especially these in-game economies, you know, the one that I always like to talk about first is this idea of prov uh, provenance. So provenance, meaning the ability to track, you know, ownership histories um, of potentially a rare item, right? So, um, you know, uh, Miles, if you're sitting at the, uh, the Lakers game and LeBron comes up to you and he gives you the jersey off his back, right? That, that is much more valuable than a jersey off the rack at, at Walmart, right? A, a LeBron uh, James jersey off the rack. So in that, in that analogy, um, you know, everyone can see that it's a provably authentic piece of memorabilia because he gave it to you live on, on TV, right? And so you can go and sell that and it's going to be worth a lot of money. Uh, without some sort of publicly verifiable tech, uh, you can't really do that in a video game, right? If I have a, a blue hat and, and you have that same blue hat in a video game, uh, there's no way to distinguish it from one another, right? The, the game developer can kind of non-transparently control that supply and if I'm a, you know, if I'm a famous gamer or Walter becomes a famous gamer uh, and you want to sell that, that, that blue hat, um, no one's going to be able to know if it's yours or if it's, if it's another one that looks just like it. So with this type of uh, digital certificate, you will be able to tell exactly when it was made, uh, who owned it before you, uh, who the current owner is, and any type of metadata around it. You know, you were using it when you won a world championship match uh, streamed on Twitch. So in that sense, you have this kind of authentic, provably rare piece of digital memorabilia in this case. So that's that's kind of one of my favorite uh, use cases. And so along with it being uh, provably uh, authentic, you can see exactly how many copies exist, right? So if the developer makes a commitment that they're only going to print a thousand of these, you'll know if they print the, you know, a thousand and one, right? You'll, you'll be able to see that. Uh, and so you'll be able to call them out on it. So if they're making these credible commitments, you, you can hold them to it. And then the last one I, I, I would like to, to touch on with this idea of NFT use cases in gaming is these new types of business models, right? So if game developers choose to embrace this idea of the secondary trading market, right? I can sell an item to you. You can sell it to Walter. He can sell it to uh, his friend. Um, each one of those hops could have a programmable rev share in them. So you could say every time this sells, the game developer gets 5%. Maybe um, you know the the a streamer that is using the likeness of that uh, item could get a percent, right? The artist who created that skin can get one percent, and so you can have this programmable rev share in perpetuity. So if the item is trading still in five years, you're getting a little bit of revenue each time. So you can you can embrace this idea of secondary trading and use this technology to create that long tail uh, of revenue. So those are some of the the more interesting use cases if you have an item that is attached to an NFT. Interesting. Walter, I'm curious, uh, from an esports organization's perspective, you hear all of these potential uses for NFTs, and it, it, it strikes me that a major part of a lot of the partnerships we're seeing in e between esports and crypto industry folks, uh, I think Team Liquid made a, a partnership with Coinbase, as did Evil Geniuses, and a couple of tournament organizers have, have made uh, uh, partnerships uh, with crypto partners. When, when they look at NFTs and these applications, how do how do those apply to what an esports organization wants to do? It's a good question. That's a good question. I think you know I'll, I'll give you a real life use case, right? Um, we actually partnered with a game called Aurori, right? Um, they're they're based on the Solana uh, blockchain, and they actually we actually created four TSM Aurorians, right? Literally, uh, you know, characters in their game, 
right? So if you, you, you basically own one of these NFTs, that would be your character in the game. So they've already minted them and then we've already sold them. And so we were able to collaborate with them to get four special ones. And so obviously we promoted the game, right? Because we, um, we, we put it on social media and things like that. And we gave away one of the Aurorians to our fans and we auctioned one off um, for charity as well for I think $70,000. And so um, we obviously promote it's like sort of a marketing type of thing, right? It's like any type of thing. We we promote the uh, we promote the game, and then we get, in return we kind of received two Aurorians. You know that sits in our Solana wallet right now. Um, I think um, another way you can think about NFTs is uh, what kind of sports teams, what kind of all sports teams are thinking about, which is kind of like a fan club, kind of like a guild, kind of like a social token. Where uh, I don't know if you've seen like the PSG token or the OG token. Um, but basically you can create these, you know, tokens, right? And then if you have a fan can earn them and can sort of buy it and that can give you special access, right? It can give you like, for example, if I, if TSM were to create a TSM out of T and a fan bought it, they could come visit, um, our facility, you know, once a year, right? They could, uh, participate in exclusive, uh, fireside chats, right? With our coaches, for example, we could even think about like a crazy thing, like a DAO which is another term, like a decentralized well, it's a decentralized autonomous organization. I think I get that right. But basically it's like, if anybody can vote based on the tokens they have, pro rata based on the tokens they have. And so what if we just had like doubt a team, right? What if we just made people just bought in all these tokens and they could decide what players they want on the TSM team, right? So that's, that's something interesting. Players can be just the GM, fans can be the GM of the team. So that's something that, um, I think esports teams are, are looking at. As a tournament organizer, uh, Chris, I know you listed a lot of potential uses potential uses for for NFTs. Are there any that stick out to you uh, specifically that um, seem like great applications for what community gaming wants to do in the future? Yeah, so um, we named a lot of, of them already, but one that we're considering now is to use them for achievements. And so as we build out our player profiles on communitygaming.io, uh, what we're thinking of doing is issuing NFTs when players complete certain achievements on the platform. So let's say you're hosting your own tournaments and you, you just finished hosting your 10th successful tournament, you may get an NFT badge, right? This could be an image that, that is minted as an NFT and timestamped uh, to prove that you did in fact host 10 tournaments and that's attached to this this digital identity you have on our site, this sort of gamer ID. And so as you start to build up this collection of these verifiable badges, you, you start to build up this idea of reputation, right? I, I would feel more comfortable joining uh, someone's tournament if I see they have that kind of guaranteed badge that they've hosted 10 tournaments before. Uh, same thing can apply from a competitive player. You know, maybe you've come in top eight in a tournament 10 times as well, you get a badge. And so, you know, while leaderboards might reset every month and, and, and things get reset, you'll have this built up collection of these, uh, these achievements and they can be represented as, as NFTs to really give extra metadata associated with this, right? You can put in data like which tournament did you play in, um, you know, which game was it for, uh, what, what did you do? You can even embed a clip and say, here was the winning clip um, of, of me winning. And so this idea of reputation and achievements is is another uh, use case that we're we're planning to implement. Interesting, and I, I think given the crossover between NFT technology and metaverse technology, uh, there there seems to be sort of an essential nature, an essential building block around what NFTs can contribute uh, to the metaverse. And I'm wondering, um, especially when we consider NFTs uh, it, it represented as a skin or uh, an item or something that can be tradable between things, do you feel like NFTs are like actually are essential building blocks to what we will think of as, as the metaverse? And and if so, what 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 sort of uh, obstacles, what sort of hurdles do we need to cross or do we need to overcome to create this sort of idealized utopian version of the metaverse, specifically around the uses of NFTs. Um, I'll start with you, Chris, and then Walter, you can come in and, and, and add your thoughts. So I'm gonna go with education on this. I think education is, is still a really big hurdle, right? Um, you know, a lot of people probably this past year have figured out how to buy an NFT on OpenSea, 
They probably had questions of, you know, why is this transaction fee so high? Uh, you know, what is the difference between Ethereum and these 10 other blockchains? I'm hearing about layer one versus layer two. Uh, a lot of players on our site just have, you know, issues understanding how to make a transaction or how to maybe sign up on an exchange and, and how, to, how to use that. So uh, I do think NFTs are going to be a core building block, right? I think tokens themselves, so fungible tokens, and then NFTs as non-fungible tokens will both be uh, core building blocks to help incentivize users, to provide deeper levels of engagement, like Walter was saying, for, uh, for fans and, and, and teams. Um, but there, there is a lot of work that still needs to be done uh, around making the, the u- user experience and the tools uh, more accessible, you know, not just to the avid gamer, uh, but to the taxi driver uh, that in the Philippines that, that wants to get involved in this, but, you know, they've never, uh, they hardly know how to use, you know, YouTube, right? How are they going to, how are you going to expect them to, to use OpenSea? So um, I think that's going to be solved over time. Uh, so I, I think, you know, there's a lot of people building uh, great applications that make it easier, but today it's still uh, quite difficult to do some of these, these transactions. I think, you know, to add on to that, I think that there are a couple of things that uh, I first I, I do agree that like NFTs and digital ownership is definitely going to be a part of video games, Web3 in the future, 100 percent. I think there are a couple of obstacles that need to overcome. Right. I think number one is, I guess, accessibility. Right. I think some of these NFTs are, are come from educate like no, no accessibility from the education perspective, but also accessibility from an economics perspective. Right. Some of these NFTs are just too expensive for certain people to buy. Right. Like you look at the axes, right. They're $300 at one point. Um, I think number two, which is, which I'll talk to on a little bit more is is sort of the stigma around blockchain and NFTs. Right. I think that um, there's a lot of people, even in the video game space. Right. And on Twitter, you see like, oh, like someone posts the board, a, you know, board ape or DGEN ape or whatever. And they're like, oh, how come I can just right click and save. Right. People don't there's a stigma against against NFTs and against blockchain that, that gaming has to overcome. Like you see the Ubisoft uh, NFT launch, right? It, it, it wasn't particularly well received, right? And so it's gonna take time for better projects to come out, for better marketing and for better understanding and education uh, for people to sort of get on board. And I think that's, only, that's just gonna take time and it's gonna take effort. I want to build on that discussion. And before I do, I want to mention to our audience that uh, there is a Q&A function uh, in the Zoom. Uh, we'll be uh, allotting some time at the end of our talk to answer some of these questions. Uh, so if you've got them, put them into the chat and we'll look them over and see if we can provide some enlightenment, uh, some insight there. Uh, but speaking about like wider misconceptions, uh, when you speak to folks, I'm assuming that the general population, you know, talk about education, the general population is much less educated uh, in, in the Web3 issues in these uh, NFT and blockchain issues uh, than the two of you are. Is there like a, 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 mis- a common misunderstanding that you come up uh, against often? And, and, and what is that? And if so, like, how do, you, how do you go about answering that in a sort of plain English that can make someone who isn't necessarily a blockchain expert understand uh, more about that issue? Chris, I'll, I'll, again, I'll start with you and then we'll go back to you, Walter. Common uh, misconception. Um, so one that I, I kind of hear maybe the most common concern is around uh, the environment, right? And, you know, particularly if this is being, you know, if this concern is, is being um, talked about with gaming and Ethereum, um, it's, it's a bit misplaced. So if I, if I can kind of maybe explain and break that down. So uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum are the two largest uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, today, they both use what's called proof of work as their mechanism to confirm uh, valid transactions. Um, it's called a consensus mechanism. And uh, Bitcoin uses an incredible amount of GPU powers from computers to uh, secure a value that's currently in the trillions of dollars, right? So it's not, wa- it's not being wasted. It's being used to confirm uh, millions of transactions each month and secure a huge multi-trillion dollar network. Uh, but Ethereum, where all of this action is taking place, right? This DeFi and gaming and all of these applications, Ethereum is already in the middle, uh, more than halfway in a transition to what's called proof of stake. And so proof of stake is a, is a type of uh, consensus mechanism that does not use um, this incredible amount of, of energy to confirm transactions. I believe the last time I looked it up, they, they're estimating that it's going to be 99.9% less energy than, than proof of work, 
And so Ethereum uh, has been in this, this multi-year transition for a few years now. And I think in the next year or so, they're going to have fully uh, migrated from proof of work to proof of stake. And so when gamers kind of you know, throw this out that it's bad for the environment, um, it, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a misunderstanding uh, because very soon it's going to kind of be a, a moot point as Ethereum uh, completes this, this transition. And most of the other blockchains that are not Ethereum and Bitcoin have all already been launched as proof of stake, right? So all of the new blockchains already are proof of stake. The main one where all the smart contract stuff is going on is about to be proof of stake. So for sure, Bitcoin probably needs to come up with a long-term plan as well. Uh, but Bitcoin really has kind of a, you know, a narrow, uh, a more narrow use case around um, store of wealth and, and kind of a digital gold. But all of the exciting stuff is going on on Ethereum. And so that, I don't think that's really going to be a valid uh, criticism for much longer. Honestly, I think that that that's that's the biggest misconception I can think of. I think the other one, maybe you know, just like the ownership, right? That people just don't understand the, the concept of digital ownership, right? And and the provenance, as as Chris mentioned, right? That the metadata is stored, so everyone knows the origin, everyone knows the transactions and what is in your actual wallet. So yes, you could just you know screenshot someone else's board ape and put it on your display profile, but it's not actually on you know it's not in your wallet, and if it's not in your wallet you don't really own it and so i think getting people to understand that and i think you know you know there are some companies some projects that are trying to like figure out like okay like open c there's a verified tag now right like okay this person actually does own this nft right and so i think i think there are there are projects that are trying to solve that 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 concept of like hey who actually owns this digital ownership yeah let's widen the lens here a little bit and think big picture in terms of where not only esports is headed, uh, but where cryptocurrency is headed and the paths that they might take together. I think we've touched on a lot of what you expect to see in the near future, but I'm wondering for both of you personally, what you want to see come out of this partnership? Like if you had your way in the industry and were able to influence both of their paths and make the choices on behalf of everybody in, in the crypto and esports space, what would you want to see them become in five years, 10 years? I know, Walter, you're thinking that far down the line because of the length of the FTX partnership. It is a, it is a massive uh, a timeline that we're looking with. And we'll, I'll start with you, uh, Walter. What, what do you want to see going forward between these two industries as they grow together? I, I, just, want, I, I'm, I, just, can't, I just want to see a killer app, like a killer game that were the people like think about it like i would love to see a mmorpg with web3 and blockchain elements where you can you own your avatar you own your land and everyone plays it and it becomes this sort of like kickstart of a virtual world i think that would be amazing that's what i'm looking forward to in the future um that could be the start of the metaverse who knows depending on your definition of metaverse but um i think that would be very cool i've always thought that it's it, it's, it's all, you know, it's kind of like, I don't know if everyone's read that player, the book Ready Player One, but that that's, that's kind of what I'm, that's what kind of I'm looking forward to, you know, for better or worse. So that's, that's what I would like to see. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Walter and I both dream of this kind of World of Warcraft 2.0 uh, world where you actually can, uh, you know, make a real living uh, playing these games. So I think as more of these games come to market, you'll see people at first in emerging markets where you know maybe they're lower income countries able to make a real sustainable living off these play to earn games. And so I, I, I think there's a lot of trends that's accelerating this. Like even before the pandemic, uh, we saw you know automation of, of some of you know truck driving jobs and hospitality jobs, factory jobs. Uh, we know five, 10 years in the future that a lot of these jobs will, will probably be automated away and they'll, they won't be as many job opportunities. And so the question is, you know, what, what will everyone do? You know, will there be universal basic income? You know, will they turn to more creative and fun work? And I guess I personally think that I think gaming will be a large part of this, right? Everything that's being talked about, about the metaverse and, and now these, these new types of uh, business models inside games that give value back to the players and have these robust in-game economies. And so, you know, I, I think that uh, I, I really hope that this proliferates um, and gives people the ability to monetize their time and to, to supplement their income or eventually in the future, maybe just be a full time uh, way to earn money and have a fun time at the same time. 
excellent. Uh, we can all dream of these utopias and, and, and the Ready Player One metaverse uh, as, as maybe the best case scenario. I'm not sure. Uh, I know we're, we're still a bit far away there, but it's, it's good to have those kind of um, ambitious visions. I want to move over to some questions that have been submitted uh, through Zoom and get your guys' take on some answers here, starting with, and these are all anonymous. So the question is, uh, wondering if there are gaming communities who form DAOs, decentralized autonomous orgs, what kind of high value NFTs do they aim at acquiring? And I'll pose this to either one of you or both of you can answer. Um, so a lot of times these guilds that are forming, there's all these regional guilds, you know, Walter mentioned YGG, uh, but uh, I've seen a, a, a database that tracks over 4,000 guilds. So a lot of these guilds are actually micro guilds. They're just small groups of friends. And so some of these high value items are, I guess maybe the most high value is digital land, right? So Sandbox um, is an incredible game where you have all of this land that you can build experiences on top of. Um, and of course you're seeing a lot of people right now buy, buy and sell them and trade them. And so that's probably the highest price, right? If you're just like in the real world, real estate is a huge market. Um, and then some of the most rare um, skins are also highly priced. And then something that's a little bit more of a complex topic is this idea of validator nodes. So in games, uh, in Gala games, G-A-L-A, -A, Gala games is a, is a really great uh, network. They're trying to kind of be like this Web3 Zynga um, you, in order to be part of the governance to validate actions in the game, you need to be able to buy a validator node. And I know those can be quite expensive these days. I think Chris answered the I Chris answered the question. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, then I'll pose the next one to you, Walter. Uh, what kind of in-game assets are the most popular? How important are avatar skins, digital fashion to gamers? And I think we sort of answered part of this question. Like land seems to be very popular, um, but maybe to rephrase this a little bit. How important are like digital skins and, and avatars uh, to gamers? Is this really something that folks feasibly invest in? I mean, 100%. I mean, if you think about League of Legends, their whole business is just selling skins. That's all they do is they just sell skins. And if you take a look at, for example, the Valorant game, right? Valorant, um, they recently ran their world championships last year, right? In which um, Ascend won, right? they released a Valorant champion skin package, right? And half of the skin sales get shared amongst all the teams that qualify for the tournament. Uh, they raised $15 million just off that one skin sales. And they share half of that, 7.5, equally amongst all 16 teams that went. And that's just one skin sales pack, right? And so the skin sales are huge. I mean, if you look at CSGO, like the, the CSGO skins, I opened up a, a, a package I forget a long time a case a long time ago. I have a knife worth four hundred dollars still trading on the Steam market, right? And so people love their 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 in-game skins, right? And and some of them are exclusive. Sometimes you know they can trade on the open market. People even buy and sell accounts because the actual skin is tied to that account. So this is pre obviously pre NFT pre pre um, Web three world. And so you know these these their business is built on microtransactions and skin sales. So a hundred percent. I bought that Valorant skin. I think uh, that whole package was like $80. It was, you know, it's really expensive, right? But yeah. it's, it's locked to my account forever, right? Imagine if I could, in a year from now, I can trade it to you, uh, Walter. Uh, you can have it because you missed out on it the first time. And those same teams can get another secondary market uh, fee, right? In perpetuity for years to come, right? But right now it's only that primary sale. They made the 15 million once and that's it. But if they were able to keep trading, uh, you could continue to generate fees as the player base gets bigger. Exactly, exactly. We've got a question from another anonymous attendee about your two's takes on the Microsoft Activision, uh, acquisition of Activision Blizzard. Friend, we talked about this. Uh, the VOD will be up soon, uh, TLDR. Very hype uh, and excited to see where it goes. We got a question from Michael Liu. How does someone who is not so familiar with this world get into it to better understand it? And what are the best investment opportunities or startup ideas now? Now, wouldn't characterize either of you as financial advisors. So maybe let's focus on the beginning of this question. What's the best way to familiarize yourself and, and learn about this exciting new industry? I mean, 
I, I, the way the way I did it is you just gotta just gotta do it. And so go go buy go 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 buy some crypto, go buy some blockchain, go go play a game. I I spent some money and bought some axes and went to go play Axie Infinity. I played it like every day, so I wouldn't lose money on my investment. <laughs> but um, that that that's how I'd really get into it. And if you aren't even familiar with you know blockchain with NFTs and things like that, I would just start with just the white papers, right? Just you know the Bitcoin white paper, the Ethereum white paper. I would start reading about it and then start trading and then eventually start playing some of these uh, blockchain games. Yeah, I mean, I'll echo that. Uh, definitely start playing, right? Skyweaver is free to play. You don't, you don't need to to make a huge upfront investment. Play that. Play Thetan Arena. Uh, join a guild, and and you can start playing Axie for free. Uh, but also go deep into the rabbit hole on YouTube videos, right? Um, something uh, a channel that I watch a lot is called Whiteboard Crypto. Whiteboard Crypto, really educational, right? If there's a new blockchain that comes out that you know that I don't know about, I'll watch a 10, 15 minute video on it. Uh, learn how it works. Same thing for these games. Um, Crypto Stash is a really great uh, YouTube channel where he talks about all the newest play to earn games. And so you can decide which game is best for you. If you want a first person shooter, an RPG, a trading card game, uh, it's, it, Axie is incredible. I love the Axie team, but there are so many games coming out. Um, so so if, if that one's not for you, they'll, they'll definitely be one that you can find. So just spend a ton of time in the rabbit hole on, on YouTube and, and uh, you know, Crypto Twitter, uh, learning about uh, the different projects. Fantastic. And I think the last question we have time for, it's, it's also the longest question that we have. I want to boil this one down to the essentials uh, from an anonymous attendee. And it's essentially talking about uh, where hubs of interest uh, in the world and countries uh, that, you've, that have per perhaps surprised you when it comes to adoption of crypto uh, gaming. Like we've seen... Um, communities build up in Africa, in the Middle East, in the Philippines, in Asia. Uh, Chris, I'll start with you. Uh, what are some of these hubs uh, that you've seen pop up and, and, and that have perhaps surprised you in their um, aggressive or at least adoption of crypto concepts? Yeah, definitely Southeast Asia has been has been huge, right? Like I think Philippines is what everyone always uh, first calls out and they have a huge adoption rate of social media, right? So. I believe Axie Infinity was discussed so much on Facebook and different forms of social media that the word of mouth there can spread, you know, very quickly when when there's um, a really cool new game or, or new project. Um, India has been especially surprising for us. Uh, there's just there's obviously so many people in India, but there, there's a huge bubbling uh, gaming market that's gaining a lot of traction there. Uh, people streaming, people playing, uh, and and the the financial aspect of these games can make it very attractive to uh, countries that that are that are emerging and, and still have uh, lower incomes for the average the average person and then looking at Latin America you know you have you have a lot of countries that have unstable currencies right so we've seen that uh, players there are more um, they're more quick to turn to fintech in general and and to cryptocurrency because they see that their currency in their own government is not working for them Right. So when they learn about stable coins and they can transact globally and it's pegged to the U.S. dollar, they just need a wallet. They don't even need a bank account. Um, they, they can quickly learn and, and dig in. So Latin America, Southeast Asia and South Asia in, in India. Uh, and I guess lastly, Africa, I would say they've been you know, using cell phone minutes as currency for a long time. So Africa tends to kind of leapfrog technologies. Uh, and so you're seeing that with with Bitcoin and, and other crypto there. Yeah, I think I think to be more specific, I think you know Philippines and and, and also Vietnam. I think a lot of the games that we talked about today are actually developed in Vietnam. I believe both uh, Thane Arena is a Vietnamese game developer studio, and then uh, Axie Infinity is also Vietnamese, right? Yeah. So, so a lot of uh, game developers in, in in Vietnam are really embracing uh, Web three and blockchain games. Um, I think that yeah, and I think you know uh, where is where is FTX based? I think they're based in the Bahamas. What what is it? Chris? They moved to the Bahamas recently. Yeah, Bahamas. So yes. So the Bahamas is also very big into in the crypto, you know. So also like another way to think about it is like where what re, what regions are, are 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 all the exchanges moving to, right? Because of the regulatory environment is is very important in crypto. And so take a look and see what what where the exchanges are moving to, what government regulations are are are, are more open to crypto. Those are the areas that are going to be are going to flourish.
Sorry, it just gave me a, a really pleasing visual of uh, S SBF putting on SPF on a Bahmanian beach <laughs> and just sipping a pina colada and really enjoying it. Uh, real quickly, before we hand it off back to you, Angelia, I want to thank both of my participants, my panelists, Walter Wong, uh, Chris Gonsalves, both of you starting with Walter, where can people find you? Yeah, uh, you know, just check us out, TSM, on Twitter, on, on all the socials. Um, yeah, we're, we're everywhere on social media, so check us out there. Our platform is communitygaming.io. Uh, definitely check it out, sign up, play in some free-to-play tournaments. And we are at Community Gaming on Twitter, and I am at CryptoGamer on Twitter. Wonderful. And I am at Miles Yim on Twitter. If for some reason you want to come into contact with me, I can't imagine why. Uh, but again, Walter, Chris, you guys are excellent. Thank you so much for taking the time. And thanks so much for everybody for watching. Uh, it's kind of a, a wonky topic. Um, if you stayed with us for the whole thing, thanks so much. Uh, and uh, thanks to Asia Society for putting this on. Anjali, back to you. Thank you so much. And we will be coming back for you to do a fourth program because there's just so much here to continue to unpack and learn. So thank you again to Chris and Walter for joining us and Miles, excellent moderation as usual. Um, I'd also like to thank our partners. Uh, thanks to TSM and thanks to UCI Esports for their promotional support. Um, also, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, please do consider joining us as a member or making a donation so that we can continue to make these programs free to the public. And just a heads up on our upcoming programs. The one we had for January the 20th has been rescheduled. It will now be taking place on February the 10th. That's the making of China's Wolf Warrior Diplomacy, a fireside chat with uh, ASSC Advisory Board member Ira Kassoff with Peter Martin, as well as we have coming up this weekend an online screening of Ascension. In case you missed the in-person screenings that we had in New York and LA. You have an opportunity to catch it from the comfort of your home. And another discussion will take place on Monday. And then again in February, we have one more program to announce now, uh, which is on artificial intelligence trends in China, India, and Japan. We'll have more updates in our e-newsletter and on our website. So please continue to follow us and tune in. And we appreciate your support and thanks so much for joining us. Have a good evening. <laughs>